Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this morning's study. And we're going to continue looking at the present truth application of Daniel 11, and verse 30 and on. A lot of things that we have to sort out. Not many people here yet this morning, but uh, we're going to begin with a word of prayer. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for the opportunity to open your word together. And we invite your spirit's presence here. Uh, we know that there's many things that we need to understand, and things that we have not sorted out. Um, but most of all, Lord, we ask that the things that we learn, that we can apply to our lives, and that they can affect us and the influence that we have around us. We ask that you can uh, be with each person watching these videos, that you can bless them and help them in their understanding. We pray for those that we have contact with, that we share things with. We ask, Lord, that we can do that in the spirit of Christ. Be with us now. We pray and ask in Jesus' name. Okay, so good morning. And we have we've worked out the, the, the historic application of verses 39, 30 to 39. And, and I think, you know, much to, at least to my satisfaction, I think that there's a lot of things that we have learned as we have done that. So I'm just going to review that really quickly. So what we have in verse 30 is the fall of Western Rome. And this is going to give us a bunch of, of keys or clues that tie us to other things. Of course, the ships of Kittim, we attach to the first four trumpets which is addressing the fall of Western Rome. And then we have, um, he shall be grieved and return and have indignation. So with the fall of, of, of Western Rome, you're going to have uh, this still this persecution by paganism of Christians, right? And, and Jews as well, with this persecution that's occurring. And it's uh, that period of 1260 years is mentioned uh, specifically as a time times and a half in Daniel 12 verse 7 that's for the scattering of the power of the holy people often people look at Daniel 12 verse 7 and think that it applies to uh, the 1260 years that is in Daniel 7 25 Revelation chapter 11 verse 2 and 3 and 12 verse 6 but that's the treading down, that's the papal supremacy. So here we have this uh, uh, 1260 years of the daily, and that is going to end. So they're going to have indignation against the Holy Covenant, that is the scattering of the power of the holy people. And then it says, so shall he do, which refers to uh, the persecution uh, that's happening by pagan Rome. Uh, and then it says, he shall even return and have intelligence with them that forsake the Holy Covenant, which is apostate Christianity, Christianity, which is Catholicism. And that is discussed in chapter three of the Great Controversy at Second Thessalonians chapter two, dealing with uh, the man of sin that's going to be exalted with paganism being taken out of the way. And so we see that happening in the next verse and arms shall stand on his part, that is, uh, the, the France, France, the king of the Franks, Clovis, who was baptized December 25th, 508. And he's going to be, be the power uh, behind the papacy, the military power, the arms. And uh, he's going to uh, be involved in putting them upon the throne of the earth. When it says they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength, it's nothing to do with God's sanctuary. That has to do with the pagan sanctuary. And she'll take away the daily. Obviously, sacrifice is an added word. So the taking away of the daily is the taking away of paganism. And they shall place or give the abomination that make it desolate. That's the setting up of the papacy. So the arms, the military might of France, is going to be involved in removing or conquering uh, these uh, different nations and making them in subjection to uh, the papacy. And such as do wickedly against the covenant uh, is going to address the Sunday law in 538. Shall he, 
uh, the papacy, the spiritual king of the north, corrupt by flatteries. So, so such as do wickedly against the covenant, these are the Christian nation, so to speak. So they are opposed to God's covenant. But the people that know their God shall be strong and do. Now, in, in this sense, this is God's people who, during the time of the Reformation, during the time of the Dark Ages and so forth, that are going to be faithful, right? So they're going to be promoting the truth. Um, and then it says, they that understand among the people that a faithful Christian shall instruct many, right? Spread the light of truth, yet uh, they, that is the faithful, shall fall by the sword and by flame, by captivity and by spoil. So this is going to be the persecution under the papal power. And this is going to occur many days. And that is uh, this period of 1260 years. Is from 538 to 1798. Now they shall fall, they shall fall, but should be holpen or helped with a little help. And that's Revelation 12, 16, where it talks about the earth helping the women, but many shall cleave to them, that is, the faithful, with flatteries, and some of them of understanding shall fall to try them and to purge them and to make them white. So what it's saying is that some will endure through this period of time. And some there will be true brethren and false brethren. So some of the false brethren will cleave to the true uh, with flatteries, right? And then they come to this period of, of Millerite history where they're going to, uh, we see the same in Daniel 12, verse 10. They're going to try to purge and to make them white. That's the three angels' messages from 1798 to 1844. Even to the time of the end, to 1798 and we say it says to the time of the end i put it at the time of the end so that this is just talking about when it begins not when it ends so the time of the end is 1798 because it is yet for an appointed time and that's going to refer to the time of the judgment begins october 22nd 1844 so these verses here uh, we can see that they bring us to uh, the three angels messages to millerite history and the question is, how do we put this into a present truth application? Now, even if we were to draw this on a line, which we haven't done yet, so we haven't we haven't taken this history and drawn a line completely. We have drawn some lines. So we have this one where we have uh, Papal Rome. So you're going to have uh, the Sunday Law Imperial Idiot uh, Focus, but you can see this just brings us up to this 1798, 1844. We didn't really draw a line with that. That is, we just have 1798 as the third angel's message arriving in this line. But we haven't drawn uh, a more specific line addressing. I mean, we do have a line, the three angels' messages line, but we haven't drawn it in connection with Daniel chapter 11 here. So, so there's some things that I still am trying to decide about that. So anyway, that's kind of where we're at right now. A any comments or any thoughts, anything carried over from yesterday? Because the idea is that we're going to go through this, uh, these verses, and we're going to write in the present truth application. Any any comments on this at this point? When I look at this, there's there's like a lot of information here. So I guess we just kind of have to start picking away at it and see what happens. So when we looked at December 25th, 508, for the present truth application, I had suggested that it refers to that the connection that we have here, that arms shall stand on his part on behalf of papal Rome, that here we can put in December 25th, 1991. I mean, part of the reason I'm putting it there is that that is the same date, but is it placed there correctly? It is we're looking at all of this history of the fall of, of Western Rome, and we see Clovis being baptized. Now, technically, we would usually put, well, 538 is the Sunday law, but December 25th also symbolizes the Sunday law, as we know. We have this 508, and this is going to begin the 1290 and the 1335, which um, I, I probably should just put here. Uh, is that 12 and 13? 
always forget which first numbers, 11 and 12. So that's just a suggestion there that we got December 25th, 1991. It shall stand on his part. So on behalf of papal Roman, there we put the papacy again, right? So we just say, well, you know, that was papal Rome in that period. You know, we could say modern Rome or modern papal Rome. But I just put the papacy. Um, we should understand what that means. Now, as far as polluting the sanctuary of strength, we know that that is a removal of paganism. So how do we relate this if we're going to apply this to our, our history? Because, you know, this is the end of the Soviet Union. Can we say that the end of the Soviet Union is equivalent to removing paganism? Is that so that the UN can then stand or just that the papacy is going to stand or is it making room for the Sunday law? Any thoughts? If you guys are all there. Okay. If now we're all agreed that the papacy or Rome establishes the vision, right? Yeah. But we keep looking to this with the UN. What if this is apostate Protestantism? Is that a possibility? Okay, where would we put apostate Protestantism? Well, the removing of paganism. I don't. We're know. we're sitting here right now. I mean, yeah. <clears throat> I've I've had to have to drift in and drift out because I'm taking care of other situations as well right now. Yeah, figure that. Are we still back with verse thirty? Well, we're looking at verse thirty and then thirty-one, right? Right. So, so verse 31, we had just dealt with um, the, the 1290 and the 1335, and they were trying to see what we do with December 25th. But in verse 30, yes, apostate Christianity, we put the papal power. Are you saying that we would uh, put apostate Protestantism there? Well, hasn't already established that Rome has forsaken the covenant with God, the holy covenant, the Kodesh covenant. Yeah. But in our, in our history, I mean, Protestantism has forsaken the holy covenant as well. So right. um, it's just, it says he shall return and have intelligence with them that forsake the holy covenant. And I put in the papal power there, but, but I really think that this is Protestant America. Well, go back up just a little bit in the same, in the same. Yeah. Position. Because you've got, have indignation, Hebrew 2194, yeah. against the Holy Covenant. And then we're saying paganism tries to destroy Christianity. So when we get down to the end, again, this repeat, isn't this Protestantism? Oh, you mean instead of apostate Christianity? Yeah. Well, that's kind of, I'm just including all of it. So Protestantism and... You know, so Protestantism would be included in apostate Christianity. But I, I just think here, like I put pagan Rome, USA, but, you know, pagan Rome could represent papal Rome. Okay. You know, and apostate Christ Christianity represent Protestantism, apostate Protestantism, right? So we're just throwing these things in here just, you know, as placeholders, because what ends up happening is... The papacy, it's going to return and have intelligence with them that forsake the Holy Covenant with, we could say, a Protestant America, maybe. All right. Right. Protestant America. Because this is this history uh, prior to 1989. Right. This is this is the history where we're going to see um, this this change in the United States. It's going to move from being a lamb-like power to speaking like a dragon. That's, and, and there's this, this history that goes on. And, and this is addressing a parallel with what happened with the taking away of the daily and the setting up of the abomination of desolation. So we're paralleling that history with the history preceding the time of the end in our history. So the time of the end in that history is in 1798, right? If you're addressing the fall of Western Rome, you know, it's, it's you know, 508 becomes the time of the end. I mean, you, you have the fall of Western Rome. 
you know, I mean, you could say, you know, 476 or whatever, but there's all these things happening. This is the transition from pagan to papal Rome. And we're saying that there is a parallel with what happens in the West, you know, that the fall of Western Rome parallels the fall, fall of the West. So, so that's where I'm having problems because we have, well, this represents the fall of, of pagan Rome. And then I said, well, pagan Rome would be the United States. But, but I think, you know, Western Rome, you, you have two aspects of Western Rome. You have, I mean, you have the part that the papacy takes over, right? Because the papacy is going to take over from paganism. So it becomes, goes from paganism to papalism. And, and that's going to happen with, uh, so I'm not, I'm not really sure, like, exactly how to do this well one of the things is we haven't really defined the ships of kism in the present truth application we discussed it a little bit you know is it some kind of philosophy what specifically does do the ships of kism represent now normally it can represent a type of uh, ships can rep- represent an economic power but it says the the ships of kism shall come against him now in the present, in the historic it's Western Rome. But here, you know, I mean, I put the West, I put USA, but maybe it's more just the West, just the West in general. Because, you know, if we look at these Germanic tribal invasions as an ideology, you know, the, Ger- the German, Germanic tribes didn't bring in apostate Christianity, right? They, they just, they brought in destruction. They ended up becoming Christians, right? at least Catholics. So when we look at what what has eroded the United States, like we talked about, well, is it, you know, modernism or postmodernism or, you know, wokeism or some kind of mixture of different isms? So what do they represent, the ships of Kitten? Now, as far as the the Hebrew numbers, they represent, um, you add them together, I think it's 10,510, if I remember correctly. It looks like that would be right. Yeah, 10,510. Okay. And as a span of time, we have some spans of time that are close. Maybe there's some other way that we connect it. But, you know, if I divide it by 365 and a quarter, it's 28 years and 283 days. So 283 days. It's 28 years. Um, and I'd looked at putting it from, let's see, where did I do that? I think I did it from, I was looking at this. I've been doing lots of other things, so I'm writing a paper on the eclipse. Okay, so if we put that December 25th. Yeah, okay. So so if I went to December 25th, 1991, it brings me to October 3rd, 2020. Now, that's in that period of time where with FFA we have those issues. Now, but it's also around the time of, you know, so like about a month or so before the American election in 2020. I don't know if there's any connection. But it's a Saturday, October 3rd, 2020. So, but that's where that would take us to. So I don't know, you know, what we would connect that to if, if we're going to take the ships of Kittim and put them into our history that way. Now, if we, um, go from November 9th, 1989, it's going to bring us to August 18th, 2018. So the significance of August 18th, 2018, that's a Saturday as well. Maybe there's some meetings connected um, with that. I know that uh, in 2018, we had our camp meeting in Alberta from the 6th to the 11th, I think it was. I got to check that again in 2018. But... Um, I don't know what was happening in other places. Stephen might know some of that stuff. Yeah, so that's going to be a week after Jeff invites Heidi and I to go down to Arkansas. And we're going to leave on the 22nd of August and, and take our time. We don't get there, I think, until the 31st of August, uh, I think. Or maybe we don't actually get there until September. I can't remember when we arrived. Um, but the point is... Uh, you know, we can take that, the ships of Kittim, maybe it has something to do with, if we're going to use it really internally, 
that have something to do with Parminder's movement, maybe. But but that's not how I was originally applying it. I wasn't really applying it to to us. I was trying to apply this in a broader sense in the present truth application. What what that would do is it would just connect what happens historically to this movement. But anyway, that's that's what I did with that. So the Germanic tribal invasions, uh, um, I don't know. We also have this 3794 just by itself. You can see that that's um, a little bit over 10 years. So it's 10 years and about 100 and what is it? 141 days, 41 and a half. So I, so I don't have any any particular thing to attach to them. Well, you know, you're... Um, yeah, the only other thing I can say is if I take the whole phrase, the ships of, of Kittim shall come, so I add the 935 days of the word uh, that's translated to shall come, it does bring me to April 26, 2023. So that's that's a symbol from last year. But, but anyway, but that, that one's interesting. Okay, so you got a comment there, Dwight? Okay, the thing I'm looking at, as we've laid this out, the ships, Hebrews 6, 7, 1, 6, yeah. that, that word is only used four times. We looked at one of those verses yesterday, which is Numbers 24, 24. Yeah. But is it possible that this, if we're looking at this in a present truth application, that we should also be including Ezekiel 30, verse 9? Okay. Okay, so in that day shall messengers go forth from me in, in ships to make the careless Ethiopians afraid, and great pain shall come upon them as in the day of Egypt, for lo, it cometh. Okay, so what's the connection other than ships? This portion of Ezekiel. Mm-hmm. It's a judgments upon Egypt. Okay. It's actually a lament for Egypt. Technically, they say in the beginning. But it's still judgments. And technically, as presented here, this would be judgment against the king of the south, right? Yeah. Right. And so that's where so that's where we're having we're having difficulty because we do need somehow because we're saying that there's a parallel between the fall of Western Rome and the fall of the US. Right. But we know that our history actually addresses the fall of the Soviet Union. So, so the question is, why, why are we first addressing this to the fall of the U.S.? Well, because the U.S. does fall as well. That is, we're looking at the Republican horn falling. Right? And that's what I think that this is addressing. So even though we have the fall of the Soviet Union, it is connected to the fall of the United States. So maybe even when we says, you know, arms shall stand on his part, you know, maybe this is something earlier that happens in United States history, that it wouldn't be December 25th, 1991, that it's going to be, you know, maybe some connection between Ronald Reagan and the Pope. Maybe there's some date in there that we would be addressing. Does that make sense? Right. You know, so, so the question is, OK, when does the when does the United States lend its support to the papacy? I mean, there are different dates that people use. There's, you know, when they first meet, um, June 7th, 1982. That's when we're going to have Ronald Reagan and John Paul II speaking in private. There's no one knows what was said. No agenda existed. No, no recording was na- made. No notes were taken. You know, is, and then is that the date that, that we connect the two? I think it's one we could. <clears throat> We could apply and see if it fits. Yeah. Okay. I know we've looked at the date before, June 7th, right? June 7th, 1982. Okay. So what we have there is arm shall stand on his part. Okay. So we got, um, so we, we didn't look at that number. So if I go, uh, Arms, that's 2220 plus 5975. Okay, so if I go back here. 
Okay, so that brings us, if I counted from there, Arm shall stand on his part. That's going to bring us to December 30th, 2016. If I take the, uh, on his part away, 2004. Um, what's that? I have a question. Where is the Isles of Kittim? The Isles, is, is that... Well, the, usually, it usually refers to just uh, some islands in the Mediterranean, like Cyprus. Okay. Oh, I got you. Yeah. Okay. Right. But, you know, historically, they just refer to it as um, attacks from the sea, right? So you're going to have, like, uh, the vandals and stuff like that, you know. <laughs> yeah, um, okay. But yeah, so we got we got two different things here. I mean, we got this the ships of Kittim, which is going to bring about the that's the the four trumpets that bring about the the fall of Western Rome. And at the end of that, um, you're going to have arms standing on his part, right? So that part is going to be the his, and that his part is going to be the papacy. Right. That is, we have this transition from pagan Rome to papal Rome that's going to be the result of Rome falling and France placing the papacy upon the throne of the earth. That's being described. So that second Thessalonians chapter two, that's being described here. Right. So we can connect Daniel 11 verse 31, obviously, to the taking away of the daily and the setting up of the abomination of desolation, that's going to be Daniel or Second Thessalonians verse two. So that we connect those two. Verse 30 is addressing that transition from pagan to papal Rome with uh, this intelligence, right? He shall return and have intelligence with them that forsake the Holy Covenant. So we say there that that's apostate Christianity because that's this period of time before we have Protestants, right? It's going to be the setting up of the papacy. Now we can we we try to parallel this as this parallel with Protestant America. What happens in our history? That's the view that I'm taking. Is that uh, the papacy is going to have intelligence with Protestant America? So the fall of Western Rome is, is paralleling the fall of the United States, and. It's going to be the fall of republicanism. The Republican horn is going to fall in our history. So we got, we got a lot of things to consider here. But still, as far as the Germanic tribal invasions, the question is, what do they parallel in our history? We still haven't answered that. Because what, the question is, what causes the fall of Rome? Now, we could say, well, is it just, you know, Protestant teachings? Is it because of the fall of Protestantism that something comes in? I mean, we could argue, if you wanted to make a comparison, Germanic tribal invasions, could you compare that with uh, German higher criticism? I mean, is that what causes the fall of the United States? I mean, that's a religious cause. I don't know. What do you think of that? Now, with this, this would be more, you know, theological problem. How do we account for what has happened to the West? I mean, definitely there's a rejection of the scriptures as an authority, which would be, you know, German higher criticism, right? Talking about the German theologians. Any thoughts on this? I mean, because there's lots of influence. There's lots of ideologies. I mean, maybe German higher criticism is just part of it. Now we're saying, well, that's the ships of Kittim. Now, normally we think of ships as dealing with economic power. Now, we had this, these ships there, but it wasn't the ships of Kittim, but, uh, in, in Ezekiel chapter 30, dealing with Egypt, you know, we got, of course, Numbers 24, 24, the ships shall come from the coast of Kittim and shall afflict Asher and shall afflict Eber, right? And so we looked at that one. So I'm not quite sure if, uh, if I want to, you know, necessarily, I mean, I think the ones in Numbers 24, so the idea here is that we have this word ships. Dwight, are you there still? No, you're going in and out. I think you had talked about connecting that with um, Numbers 2424. That's in Balaam's uh, first uh, blessing. 
and he's trying to curse Israel. I don't know. Any thought about the Germanic tribal invasions as being connected to the ships of Kittim? Because they're going to come against the West, <clears throat> Western Rome initially. Is there any other way that we can understand ships here? Hmm. Okay. So, well, I'm going to leave German higher criticism there. So they come against the West. So therefore he shall be grieved and return and have indignation against the Holy Covenant. So the question is, who is he? Because he shall, uh, so it says, the ships of Kittim shall come against him. So the him, it should be the one that's grieved. But we got grieved, return, and have indignation. So there's three steps here. How do we address these three steps? We know they're symbol of the three angels' messages, the three-step process. So grieve, return, and have indignation. Oh, that's where I got that number before. Okay. Um, so I was talking about this number 13,431 before. And that actually is um, adding up grieved, return, and have indignation. So that was that number I was looking at as a span of time. So if we, so if we count that from when the Pope and Reagan meet, that's going to bring us to March 16th, 2019. Is that significant at all? March 16th, 2019. Anybody have any thoughts on that? I mean, it happens to be a Sabbath. So <clears throat> let's see what I can do with that. Period of 34 weeks from before November 9th, 2019. I don't know. I don't have a good answer on this one, but I, I do want to keep that on the back burner. There's something you said, about. You yeah. said March 16th of 2019. Yeah. And if I, if I count, so that's 238 days before November 9th, 2019. And if you count 238 days before that, you get July 21st, 2018. So I don't know if that makes sense, if there's something about, I mean, obviously July 21st is midnight. It's your birthday um, in 2018. <clears throat> um, that's going to be uh, six days before Daniel from Brazil makes that prediction on the 126 days. So it's not specifically tied to anything. But I just think that there's something about this 14, 000, or 13,431. So that's these words, right? The, the three steps. Um, grieved, return, and have indignation. So this is what these Germanic tribal invasions do. And we're saying that this is German higher criticism. Or at least that's, that's the suggestion I have. I'm not saying we, we can't include, nobody else has agreed to that. But if we take this, it says a period of time, this grieving, returning, and having indignation. It's got to have some significance. Now, so that's the, that's going from the date uh, June 9th, 1982, right? So we got yeah, June 7th, pardon me, 1982. So the, that's going to be the first time they meet. Do we know when they first discuss? Is that when they discuss overthrowing the Soviet Union? Or do we know specifically? Is that just speculation? I'd have to think it's speculation at the moment. But So June 7th, 1982. They meet. And 13,431 days later is March 6, 2009. March 16th, 2019. 238 days before. Now that's 490 days before July 18, 2020. I don't know if that's significant. Can we attach that then to it? Um, so if we count from when the Pope and Ronald Reagan meet, we, it brings us to March 16th, 2019, and that's 490 days before July 18, 2020. So is that, does that mean that that's an actual connection or just a coincidence? I'm looking at it as a connection. Okay, so I'll just show you this here, just so you can see, you can see that. So we got this, this down at the bottom, there's the dates. So you got June 7th, 1982, 
That's when the Pope and Reagan meet. I counted 13,431 days, so that's grieved return and have indignation. The Hebrew numbers added together. And that brings me to uh, March 16th, 2019. And then, you know, I counted 238 days between uh, November 9th, but then I thought, well, that's a Saturday, that's a Saturday. It's 252 days, so I added those together, it made 490. So, so we got this, this and the 490 together give us July 18th. So can we do that? Can we just say, well, we have this date. It doesn't mean anything to us particularly, but it does connect with 490 to an important date. Now, maybe there's something about March 16th, 2019 that we don't know, but we know in that, in our history that there is things going on at that time in connection with Parminder becoming the head of, of the movement. So Jeff is in uh, the camp meeting that they're going to have. That's going to start on March, I don't know, March 29th or something like that. March 28th. I can't remember. March 30th, starting at the end of, of March. So that's going to be just before that. And then 490 days later, we're going to have July 18, 2020. So, I mean, maybe there's something on March 16th within the movement we just don't know about. But it is a Sabbath. I don't know. Maybe, maybe Jeff does some kind of presentation there that uh, is a premonition of what's going to happen with handing over the, the reins to Parminder. I don't know. Right. But, but what we're doing is we're connecting this, the ships of Kittim to, you know, to the fall of, of the United States. And then uh, this part here is, therefore shall he be grieved, return and have indignation against the Holy Covenant. So we're just saying, well, we can count from that, that date and using those Hebrew numbers. And then 490 is going to bring us to July 18, 2020. So maybe that's like a period of probation or something like that for the movement as far as accepting her. Because Parminder's message, I mean, it's going to be developed in that period of time that people are going to be confronted with Parminder's views. I mean, I know what I'm doing at that time. You know, Tab was writing me emails and telling me that basically I'm not supposed to share the the July 18, 2020 prediction. I um, wonder if I can find out here. Because um, if that's the Sabbath that I actually presented July 18th to Tabo. Okay, so, yeah, I need to find out about that March 16th, 2019 date. You know that the International Criminal Court wanted to start investigating uh, the U.S. on that date for alleged crimes in Afghanistan. Okay. So, and then the uh, Secretary of State at that time denied the International Criminal Court investigators visa for, you know, to allow them to investigate that further. There were also quite a number of protests around the globe regarding climate change and this was tied back to Greta Thunberg. So okay. the the least interesting thing was that Bernie Sanders on that date announced that his campaign for president would be staffed entirely by union workforce. And they were using workers from the United Food and Commercial Workers. Mm-hmm. So UFCW to represent the staffers. Yeah, I remember something about that. So, yeah. So I wanted to look at my email here, which. uh, So in my email, if I can find that discussion with Tavo, because I know it's in March that I'm going to present at Collins. I'm going to present to Tavo. But I, I just don't know how I'm going to find the exact date that that occurred, what what I could do to – because I'm going to present July 18, 2020. And then he's going to just say, you you can't present this anymore. And then he cuts off communication with me after that. And all these crazy emails from him that make no sense. 
yeah, so sorry about this, but I just got to, this must be some way that I can look at either my notes that I presented, maybe the date of those. I just know it's around that time, 2019. Okay, well, I did pre prepare, prepare some studies on that uh, just, just before that. I kind of think that that was the Sabbath, but I have no way of proving it uh, at this point. So I, I think that was the Sabbath because I know it was in like the middle of March somewhere. But, you know, it could have been the Sabbath before, could have been the Sabbath after. Okay, so the idea that we have here that we're, we're, we're struggling with and in understanding this. So we have the ships of Kittim, the dramatic tribal invasions. We're going to attach, at least I suggest, to German higher criticism. That is, now for people who don't really understand the significance of what happened with the German higher critics, it is, um, and I should could just say German criticism. Uh, doesn't necessarily could be even the lower criticism, but um, we have um, it, it affected not just theology but all kinds of thinking. Okay, I'm just looking at some things here. Now this is going to because oh it, it, it has such a broad effect. So sometimes it's German literary criticism. Uh, is there any way that we could sort anybody know much about it, how we could just distill it in a, in a very brief way? So it's looking at the text critically, but how do we describe that? Okay, let me see. So they, they deal with not just, so you've got textual criticism that addresses the documents themselves. So the Bible itself, creating a critical edition. But you also, and so that would be, um, you know, textual criticism. But it, it affects all kinds of other areas of thought. Um, so I don't know. It's, it's a way of looking at the world. I just don't know how to describe it. I mean, it's going to start generally, it's a criticism of rationalism. A lot of this is sort of philosophical. I don't want to go into all that language. So I don't know German criticism, if that's the best way to look at it. Any, any suggestions? I mean, it's, it's what leads to, um, really the undermining of, of our society as far as I'm concerned. Because it's a type of systematic, uh, theology. Okay. So I'm going to look at biblical critic criticism here. Okay. Other schools of biblical criticism that are more exegetical in the extent that is concerned with recovering original meanings of texts include redaction criticism in which studies, which studies how the documents were assembled by their final authors and editors and historical criticism, which seeks to interpret biblical writings in the context of the historical settings. So the scientific principles on which modern criticism is based depend on part on viewing the Bible as a suitable object, object for literary study rather than as an exclusively sacred text. The evaluation of the scriptures to uncover evidence about historical matters was formerly called higher criticism, a term first used with reference to the writings of the German biblical scholar J.G. Eichhorn, who applied the method to a study of the Pentateuch. In the 20th century, Rudolf Bultmann and Martin Debelius initiated form criticism, as a different approach to the study of the historical circumstances surrounding the biblical text. So, so you got all these different types of things, textual criticism, sometimes called lower criticism, uh, philological criticism, literary criticism, tradition criticism, form criticism, exegetical, redactive, historical, right? So you got these different forms of, so can we say, is, is this, Valid in saying that this is the reason that the United States falls. Is that the basis of it? Is there some other way that we could look at? Because this, we're comparing it with Germanic, Germanic tribal invasions. And that's why I, I looked at German criticism. Just the German part. I'm not trying to blame the Germans for anything. It's just, I mean, we have all of this unravels the basis for the American Constitution, because this is going to lead to humanism. And a lot of the other isms are drawn from this. 
I mean, you could even go back to the Enlightenment um, or the, the Luminists, philosophies and so forth. But it's, it's, it's a rejection of the sacred text. It's something that can be criticized. No, not in that link. Saying bad things about it, but just to be studied like you would with any literary text. Any thoughts on this? Am I barking up the wrong tree? Okay, so let's think of it of this way. So we have we have some kind of an attack now. You know, and I would say that you know we could just say, okay, how about we do this? You're in modernism. We could just say modernism. Now, what is modernism? Where do we trace that? Anybody know what modernism is? Now, we talk about postmodernism. Would it be connected with New Age? No. New Age? No. So it, it's it's basically a philosophical movement, religious movement, an art movement uh, during the late 19th and early 20th centuries, right? So it affects how we look at art, how we look at culture, how we look at religions. It, it has to do with interpretation of texts. So the, these are, uh, I mean, it's kind of hard to explain these things in really simple terms. A lot of it has to do with what is aesthetic. But you could look at, you know, people like um, Picasso. That's modernism. It, it actually sets the stage for a type of dis, uh, deconstructionism, if you know what that is. So so there's a bunch of things going on. Nietzsche, you know, it's it's a different way of looking at the world. And there's a conflict that's going on in the 1800s. Uh, you have the rise of these different ideas, socialism, communism, uh, ideas. So these are parts of modernism. Does that make sense to people? I mean, because it's, it's not a, a, a simple subject. So if you just say this German modernism or modernism even just on its own, as something that's going to undermine the foundation of the United States. It's going to undermine the institutions eventually, right? It, it sets the groundwork for what we have today. But you know, it's, it, I mean, it's, it's not a simple topic. Okay. So I'm just going to leave German modernism in there. And so can we say that what this grieving, returning and having indignation against the Holy Covenant in our history, in the fall of the West, is this connection of of what's going what's going to happen with the, the papacy in the United States? That there is this reaction. I don't know how to describe it. It's, it's, it's like too broad of a topic. Okay, so when he's grieved, returns and having indignation. Historically, that's the continuation of the 1260 years of the daily. So this is a persecution against the Holy Covenant. So that is, this philosophy is seeking to destroy Christianity, right? That is, and, and some people even argue that, that this comes from, because are, are people familiar with, with uh, Wagner, Wagnerian operas? I don't know how much you people know about music. Who is that again? So, uh, Richard Wagner, he was a German composer. Um, and, uh, they do a lot of mysticism, that is a lot of stuff dealing with Ger Germanic myths and, uh, you know, and I, it's music I hate. So I've never been interested in Wagner, but it's, it's, it's very dark. I mean, this is stuff that, that, um, is, uh, well, let me see here. So the idea of German, the, so Hitler loved Wagner, right? This, this is the idea of this sort of primitive pagan, pagan, um, ideals. So the idea of all this German paganism, can we see the parallel between that, that it's, it's the thing that is actually the root that is trying to destroy Protestant, Protestantism? Does that make sense? Or am I, I'm too, or am I being too philosophical here? Because here we can just say this is German paganism, because that's Wagner, seeks to counter uh, true Protestantism. Now, I hope that's, you know, understandable. This is not something that we generally talk about uh, within Adventism. We don't, because it's not, it's not an area that people commonly are familiar with. 
So how the West was lost. I mean, there's lots of theories, but this is where I would go. So often we'll just look at, well, you know, the papal influence and, and so forth. But really, it, it goes back, and, and definitely the papacy has a part to play in all of this. But this, this idea of German paganism, you know, that it seeks to, well, I put counter, but probably destroy is better. Whether it's actually seeking to destroy that specifically, or it just happens to, I don't know. This is a little bit different picture when, that we have here. So we're saying that this, this is sort of the, the groundwork that is laid. Now, when we have, he shall be grieved, return and have indignation against the Holy Covenant. We're saying that German paganism seeks to destroy Protestantism. I don't know if that's really where we should put that. Maybe we should put that somewhere else. This is just kind of new to me to think through it this way. So we have a lot of things that we have to sort out. We have some some numbers and dates, um, spans of time. Hmm, I'm really going to have to think about this before we get back into this next week. Because right now I'm just bogged down. There's just, there's too many things I have to look up. Okay. So the one thing we can say is we can take that grieved return and have indignation. So I'm going to put this here in the notes. That's going to be, which, what are those numbers? Three, five, one, two, seven, seven, two. So if I add these together, I'm going to equal. One three four one three. from uh, June seventh, nineteen eighty-two to March sixteenth, twenty nineteen, plus three ninety equals July eighteen, twenty twenty. Okay, so we put that in there. We think it's it has some significance. It seems. Something to be not very likely. You know, the Reformed Seventh-day Adventist Church emerged during the Nazi rule. So Angela just has a comment about that. Because regular SDAs capitulated with Hitler for Suki L. D. White's council and the precedent set in the first civil war and joined the Nazi army. Yeah. Yeah. So to understand German mysticism, I don't know how many people are familiar with it um, and how how the Nazi movement is a part of that. And we can see that there is actually, I mean, they were seeking to take over the world with this new philosophy, but they also were trying to undermine it, you know, not just with military power, but you know, long before that. So I don't know. But anyway, I think that's where we'll stop today. And I gotta, I'm going to have to think about a lot of these things here. Once I get my paper finished on the eclipse, then I can devote a bit more time to this, but. The eclipse paper, always, every time I write a paper, it always takes way more time because I end up finding more and more things. Okay, any final comments before we close with prayer? Okay, let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for the study today. Even though we didn't get very far, uh, we are thankful for the things that you have showed us. And we pray for one another and that when we come together to study, that your spirit will be there. Um, pray for the Friday night study and the Sabbath morning studies. And we pray for each person, for one another. We know, Lord, that we face many trials and we need your presence every day. Thank you for being with us. And um, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.